The Dampier to Bunbury pipeline had a refinancing requirement following a series of capital improvements to their asset. We'd identified there was an opportunity for the pipeline to turn that debt out. Um, we went out with a minimum $300 million raising in the five-year tenor, and we're actually able to build that up to $575 million. The client was absolutely delighted with the outcome. Having now established relationships with a range of debt investors globally, the company's in a fantastic position to quickly access markets again in the future. Well, Rufus, welcome to CEO Hub on Business Spectator. Great to be with you. Now, you've obviously had a rich and varied career, including McKinsey and now Master of Ormond College. From your experience, what defines a CEO? Uh, I don't think there is a single CEO model. Uh, the quest for the perfect model of leadership, the perfect CEO, I think is a false quest. Um, I think it's all about context, whether the person's bringing that set of capabilities that any particular organisation requires at the time. The leader for growth is a diff for a period of growth is different to a leader in a period of enormous cost, cha of cost challenges. But, but I suppose to some extent the CEO uh, is defined by their leadership qualities. Yeah. Do, do you think that they translate or are broader than the, the company that, in which, that they're leading and that they have more, more general leadership or should have and need to have more general leadership qualities? I, I I do, I think, but leadership in lots of ways is, is both a choice about effectiveness and about integrity. So on the effectiveness side, I think, you know, CEOs who uh, attend as much to the human ecology of their businesses as they do to the commercial ecology tend to ultimately produce better, you know, significantly better businesses. Um, and there's a bunch of leadership qualities associated with that. But I think leadership is also a question about whether you will let the organisation, the industry, uh, define who you are or whether you are bringing a confidence about what you think matters uh, into that. And I think you know, the leaders who are, kind of, are often a bit more definitive are the ones who say, I won't be totally captured um, by what an industry expects or requires um, of me or what my organisation requires because there's pieces about me that are going to be you know, distinctive contributions. I think the thing that you can, the insight that perhaps you can bring to bear on the subject is the role of ethics in the, the, the being a CEO. What, what's your view about that? Do you, do you think, I mean, cause, because there's obviously there's lots of different sites of CEOs, as you, yeah. as you point out, some are ethical, some are not so ethical. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for a CEO, the question is, are you going to live simply in an economic way of thinking about the world, um, where ethics has a role, but it's often a role of, um, it plays second fiddle to the basic obligations around you know, shareholder value. Um, and there's lots of ethical things that turn out to be valuable for achieving shareholder value. Um, you can think about it that way. It's not a way I think is ultimately the right way to think about it, because uh, I think... Why not? I mean, what's, what's right and wrong in this context? Well, ultimately, um, I think you can, ex can ask some, some basic questions about why we allow corporate, why corporations exist, um, which go back to, you know, we permit co corporations to have a remarkable set of freedoms in our community, not least their limited liability, um, in order to enable them to pursue worthwhile things. Um, whether it's providing banking or telecommunication services or choice in the choice in the retail in the retail world, they exist actually for a moral purpose to contribute something worthwhile to the community. Ultimately, what governs the modern corporation is a is a community permission to do things, and I think that has. So you're talking about the community license or the yeah, license a, to operate that a company has. A lot I, of CEOs, I think, do talk about that these days. Yeah, that, and I think that's an, a really important construct because it says ultimately there are things that you do because it's what the purpose of your organisation is even if that may not be the economically maximising thing. They rarely do they come into violent tension um, with each other and if they do they should, that tension should be debated. But providing ba basic banking services that are affordable, that are affordable to people that don't leave you out of pocket um, because you've used them or similarly basic connectivity um, those kinds of, uh, of elements, they're what comes with these enormous set of privileges that, um, that lar large organisations uh, get. So I think inevitably if you're thinking about running an organisation, you should be thinking within an ethical 
framework. It's really only in a pretty short period of our history, a kind of post-Milton Friedman, which said the only obligation was to maximise shareholder value, that I think we have so narrowed um, our understanding of what the obligations around leadership and really, you, do, you, do, you just about. think it was post Milton Friedman? I think that's where it's become its most dramatic. That's where the there's been a much stronger ideological underpinning for this narrower construct of what a corporation's uh, what a corporation's about. And it, you know, modern people, very few people are you know Adam Smith enthusiasts. Um, you know, very few people are, appreciate that he also uh, you know his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I mean, he placed the economic world firmly within a, within a moral universe. Um, and I think we, we kind of too easily forget that. Um, and perhaps didn't always, you know, in past times, perhaps didn't always forget it quite as much. Just researching you, uh, I was interested, the way that you've lived your life, in a way, was yeah. to provide yourself with the financial freedom to pursue the things that you want to do or the, the things that you believe are the right thing to yeah. do, rather than to, as it were, kind of maximise your own... Uh, personal wealth. Yeah. Um, uh, to what extent do you think CEOs do that? That, that really what they're trying to do is climb the corporate ladder in order to to, to win the lottery, as it were, <laughs> that, that comes with being a CEO. I mean, do, do you often see people who become CEOs for reasons other than making a lot of money? Um, CEOs I've worked with over the years, very few of them, uh, I mean, most of them pass the money kind of barrier, you know, sometime before they became CEOs and it's a much more complex set of very kind of human reasons that people go on to uh, want to lead. There's, to some degree sometimes the salaries are keeping some kind of score and um, but most of them have a complex set because of Because there's been a big emotions. stretch. The, 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 the amount that a CEO gets versus what an ordinary worker yeah. gets has stretched um, you know, the difference is, uh, is quite considerably yeah, stretched it's become, in recent years. Uh, quite dispropor quite so disproportionate. So you wonder who's been driving that, if not the CEOs. Well, I think it's where you get, a, where you get one of these kind of vicious cycles uh, going. Once, once there's some movement, um, then people are comparing, is the, you know, money becomes the comparing of, is this job of equal worth and status as the job the other, the next, the next CEO is, uh, the next CEO is doing, and perhaps a little, you know, lack of, strong governance um, to say, hang on, we can't, you know, there are some values we start to embed in our organisations when we let that gap get too big that we ultimately are uncomfortable about. So I think ultimately CEO pay is a, an equation between CEOs and their boards and what they think their organisations are about and some calibration with what kind of country they think they are ultimately contributing to creating, whether they are part of, you know, splitting um, you know, yeah. creating greater divides or keeping them at some, you know, appro more appropriate, more appropriate level. And not no, least, because uh, most of the CEOs don't need the money. No, well, that's the point. And I suppose <laughs> I'm interested in that because, yeah, and as you say, a lot of them in terms, you know, in terms of their own yeah. requirements, past the money needs a long, long time ago. ago. However, and they often say, uh, I don't do this for the money. Yeah. But I wouldn't do it for less than five million. <laughs> Well, that's where so, we've got it. Uh, yeah, that, that's where I think as a community, as both an Australian community and a commercial community, we need to start to have it cycling down to a more modest level, just as in the boom times it cycled to the wrong level. It, there's a first mover problem. Um, who goes first? Um, and that's why we're going to have a climate that encourages multiple people to start to set some more realistic numbers. You've um, got quite a wide range of interests and, and outside things, yeah. apart from being a Master of Ormond College. How have you gone about choosing those? What's, what's the theme of your life? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the theme, is ultimately, uh, the theme is ultimately about transforming human lives. What are the things that make the greatest difference to enabling us to live full human lives? I happen to think education is at the very centre of that. Um, so you know, that means I choose both in this environment to want to, to want to create a transformative environment that'll shape people and make a difference in the world, but also chair the board of Teach for Australia, um, which is about tackling educational disadvantage. Um, and, and I was involved in a global non-profit that has the same mission, Teach for All, because um, ultimately education has to be transformative for all people. 
Um, you know, and one of our issues in Australia is there's a long tail of educational disadvantage that we don't uh, that we don't tackle. Um, but I also choose to do some things in the public in the kind of public sector world because um, ultimately, you know, the great you know challenge of in some ways this half of the century is a public sector that continues to deliver uh, improved services for an ever greater range of people, and also that as a nation we're making our, you know, our big challenge is a public sector productivity challenge um, and ensuring that we get the same level of quality out of our public sector as we do out of parts of our private sector. How do you see the future of uh, sort of the contract between the community and corporations in general? Where do you think it stands now and where is it going in the future? I don't think, the co in interestingly, I don't think the GFC shook up that contract as much as many people expected. I don't think it's been fundamentally rewritten. Um, Do you think it should be? Uh, I, I think it will need to be um, over time. Um, I don't think this is a radical enterprise and it's as much to do with what we think, um, it's as much to do with what's the next way in which of thinking about the role of government and society as it is about business. We tend, do tend to throw, project a lot of the kind of broader community challenges onto the business community to look for a solution to. But I think uh, you know, the challenge of our current political environment, the disenchantment of the last election that politics hadn't, wasn't any more about real matters of substance. Um, there's a much broader agenda here which runs from, from government across the business community of a, a wider community looking for all of our institutions um, to be about how do we live better lives, how do we live lives that are more fulfilled, that are more worthwhile, uh, how, do we do that more, how do we do that more inclusively, how do we evolve the next sense of what it is to be Australia in the world. These are the bigger um, questions. And look, in some parts of the world, the rethinking has begun. In Britain, um, you know, the Great Society discussion, um, the conversation about you know, what actually is the role of government um, that comes you know, to some surprise more from the right than the left. Um, I think that's the next agenda of the conversation. But it's not just a business conversation, it's a whole of community conversation. It's been great having you. Thanks very much for joining us, Rufus. Great pleasure. Thank you for having me.